I'm delighted to see that there are so many people here to, to take this course. And uh, optimization is a very important screen. part of... Uh, you should share the screen, maybe. Pardon? Share, share the screen in the Zoom. Ah, oh, you didn't enter into the... Pardon? Uh, the Zoom meeting. We have created a Zoom meeting. Can you just turn off your... Uh, yeah, uh, turn off. On the show. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. We have some technical problems to sort out. <laughs> So if you turn on your camera and then follow it the ah, direction. Okay. okay. We have to send out the pictures on the net. Okay. So I will give an introduction here to optimal control, which is an important subject. Uh, to those of you who haven't seen me before, I came here in 1965 and started this department. So it's fun to be here again. So <clears throat> I will do an introduction, and I will first talk about calculus and variation, which is the beginning of optimization. Then we'll talk about optimal control. I will talk about computations. I will talk about stochastic optimal control. And I will draw some conclusions in here. And this is an important subspeciality of control. Uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, it all started with calculus variations. You know, it's a classical part of mathematics where we have people like Bernoulli, Newton, Euler, and Lagrange. And there was a golden era from 1930 to 39 of the Department of Mathematics at the University of Chicago, where they essentially cleaned the whole field up. And there are some, so they, they refined, they polished, and streamlined. And there are some excellent books of this that we'll talk about. Uh, so by 1940, calculus variation was essentially done. And then something very interesting happened in control. The space race. We needed to shoot rockets up into the air, and we did not have very strong rockets, so it's very important to control them accurately to shoot them up. So essentially, you don't, you don't fire everything to start with, because then you waste everything on friction. So shoot them up gradually. And that was an important problem uh, for the space race. And there were some very important things that happened. Number one, we got dynamic programming by Bellman. And he had already started this uh, a bit before. And the key idea of that was to do uh, dynamic programming. In Russia, there was a very good mathematics researcher called von Dryagin, and he invented the maximum <laughs> principle. And it came about when you are controlled, you have limits on the control action. Uh, so you have a new control problem where to find the optimal solution, provided that the control lies in a certain boundary. And they came up with a maximum uh, principle for that. And there were various other things. There were Lasalle came up with a bang-bang principle. And there were uh, numerical solutions were developed because that's the only way to solve these problems. And then, uh, lately on, we got something called model predictive control. You can say it's a late add-on add to this. Uh, and it's interesting that many of the results were developed outside the traditional fields because... Uh, it happened during the Second World War. It was very important to, to the war effort to solve this problem. So at, at UK, they had something called Tissard Mission. At MIT, they had the Radiation Lab, which was tremendously important. At MIT, they also had the Instrumentation Lab, which was run by a man called Draper, which is a very interesting person. Uh, I have to tell you Draper's story. Uh, if you work at MIT, you are not allowed to drink alcohol. But if you happen to have alcohol, you were not allowed to drink it before six. So Draper had a bell in his office. He pushed his bell, and then he had a watch, which called Instrumentation Laboratory Stand Time. And then he stopped at one minute past six, and then the bell rang with secretary. And uh, you were not allowed to store liquor at MIT. So he had rented a room to the Air Force, and that's where he had, he had the liquor. So when he pushed the button, his secretary came out with two dry martinis. Uh, so that was Draper. And then there's something called the Rand Corporation, which is an interesting thing you will talk a little bit about. In Sweden, there were similar, similar things happening. I mentioned a few things. I, I will talk about something called Saab R Systems. And I will mention Lars Erik Sackerson, because he's the grandfather of Anders Ranser. You know, Anders Ranser did his PhD for one of the students of Lars Erik Sackerson. And we'll mention something called the PTN group. But the radiation lab, what they did uh, for the war, they gathered a lot of scientists to solve problems that were of interest in the military. And at MIT, they created the radiation laboratory. 
And afterwards, they documented everything. So they had radar, 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 Lorian, Pulse, etc. And somewhere down here, you find 23 theory, server, and mechanisms by James Nichols and Phillips. So they documented everything afterwards. And this is one of the early books of control that came out of this one, which I think is still very worthwhile reading. <coughs> and then the Rand Corporation. It was set up as a non-profit organization, a think tank, uh, by the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, and it was run by U.S. Air Force. You can see here a few people. This Richard Bellman. Dancy was the one who invented linear programming. Henry Kissinger, you've heard of. Uh, John von Neumann, famous mathematician. Condoleezza Rice, another politician you might have heard of. Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Samuels, who was an economist. So we're starting a whole range of, of policy problems which were related to the, the military effort. Uh, in Sweden, we had the rule say we are going to be non aligned in peace and neutral in war. This was broken very recently when we decided to join the NATO. So this was an old principle. And we, would have, we, had, we were afraid of the Russians. So we were developing uh, very good air defense systems. We were de uh, SAW was developing aircrafts. And we had something called FUA, the Research Institute of National Defense. And uh, they were digging up uranium, and we were actually making an atom bomb. Not much talked about, but that's what we're doing. At KTH, they had a professor of aeronautics, Lutander, who was very, uh, very active in the whole field, as was mentioned. And then you had the Army, Navy, and Air Force procurement agencies, and they worked very closely together with the universities. And then we have SAW, which I will talk more about. We have Bofors, we had Volvo, and they made, um, in particular, Volvo fleet motor, who made um, aeroplanes. And then the electro we had an electronics industry with uh, uh, there were lots of electronics companies who were signed up to this. But FUA, the Research Institute of National Defense, uh, they were concerned uh, with, with, here we have some interesting people. Uh, this passion, he was in charge of the group. Gunnar Brodin, he later became the chancellor of the Swedish university, then he became advisor to the king. And here's Svante Jomper, a, a school friend of mine. Uh, and Lars Erik Sackerson, he invented, uh, 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 he was looking at missile guidance, and he invented what's called professional, proportional guide navigation. It's called Swift Bearings Principle in Swedish, which is a better word. Uh, and then uh, we were working on international guidance in very close collaboration with Draper. And I became drawn into this, so that's how I learned automatic control. And then there was a lot of simulation. We had nuclear reactors, and we were making weapons, for example. Together we saw they developed an air missile like this. So there was a lot of activity going on. Some of our systems was copied of the RAND Corporation. So RAND was, uh, so SOM persuaded the Air Force that they should sponsor a research organization similar to RAND. And uh, they formed something called the R Systems, and they hired a very talented aerospace engineer for KTH, <coughs> Hans Olof Palmer. He was related to the Prime Minister of Sweden, which helped a lot. And he was an enthusiastic, charismatic leader. And what he did, he, he recruited a pool of about 75 people in 1955. He traveled around the university industries, and then he persuaded his people to come to SOM. And they had three groups, systems, avionics, and special projects. And they looked at airborne computers, missile guidance, inertial navigation, simulation. And then the electronics industry in Sweden was threatened by this. So they started their own company, or two up, as a competitor to SOM or system. So here's Lars Erik Sakrasov. He studied engineering physics at KTH, and then he worked on missile guidance uh, at FUA, and he invented proportional navigation. He also invented Markov games, and he did this in connection with tank duels. So you have two tanks who are battling each other, and then he invented a mathematical model for this, and he used Matt Markov games. And we, this was published in... Uh, in a, a book in Princeton. There was a man called Isaac who has big, made a big name on Markov games, but Sackerson was actually before that. 
and then who worked at our systems for six years, and then he became a docent in automatic control in 1959. He became professor in optimization system three in 1963, and his first PhD student was, was Anders Lindqvist in 1972. I have to tell you a story about this. The, he applied for the professorship in automatic control at KPH. And uh, the faculty, uh, uh, there was, uh, the, uh, the faculty really wanted to have him, so they voted for him. But then ABB, they thought Sackerson was too theoretical. So they went up to the government and they did politics and made sure that Sackerson didn't get this professorship. And then KPH got mad and they created a, a new department, optimization and system theory. And that's why we have, have two departments of control at KPH. We have the control department, and then you have a more mathematically oriented uh, system here at KPH. Uh, and as I said before, Anders Linklist was his first graduate student, and he was the, the uh, supervisor of Anders Ranzi. Uh, here I illustrated the uh, uh, missile guidance. Suppose I'm sitting here and I'm going to hunt, hunt a missile. The simple way is to steer towards the missile, and then you see this thing is going to happen. The missile is coming here, I'm aiming for it, and then you see it here. A much more clever way is to do something like this. You figure out, you draw a line to the missile, and then you control your, to the, 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 you, to the aircraft. And then you control the missile so that the line of sight is in a constant angle to, the, to your own vehicle. And then you get this trajectory. You know, you, you hit it directly, and it's a much shorter path. So that was a very good invention. And it was actually available in American papers, but Sackerson came up with this idea by himself when he they would work at Missile Guidance at FUA, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, <coughs> they also formed something called TPN Group, Theoretical Inertial Guidance Group. And that was also sponsored by the Air Force. And they took a professor at KTH called uh, Benji Willanderson, that's him. Typical lecturing style, you know. black dress, hand in pocket, and then the short. Uh, and uh, there were, we were three people working. John Mary, which I showed a picture for, Nils Oster was a physicist, and myself. We had very close collaboration with Phillips and Greenshaw. And the idea was to look at um, inertial navigation. At the time, there was only one computer in Sweden. And we had free access to this. We could run as much as we wanted to on the computer. That was a huge benefit. And then we had a strong connection to MIT. So Draper was over in Sweden several times. Uh, I was guiding him around. And he also had another colleague who was here for, for, six, for three months altogether. So we, we picked up a lot of information from, the, um, from uh, MIT. And for me, it was a fantastic learning experience. For example, the companies, they knew much more about control than uh, what was known at the universities. So I came uh, running into a, a guy at Philips that I did a lot of uh, interesting work with. So it was a fantastic learning experience. You know, you met all these people who solved you so interesting problems, you could compute as much as you wanted, which very few people could do at the time. Uh, the only drawback was that um, practically everything we wrote was classified. So when I applied for the professorship down here, I had to declassify a lot of reports. So there was a drawback with sequence. What was Greenshaw? Oh yeah, Greenshaw, I should mention. Greenshaw was uh, uh, an area south of Stockholm. And that's why they, they tested the missiles. Okay. So uh, a lot of missile testing was done. So we went down there to see the test of the missiles. So it was an interesting learning experience. And then I came to Lund, and uh, one of the areas I picked up was optimal control. So my second PhD, Christian uh, Bortensson, he, he, he did a PhD in optimal control. Torke Glad is not in Shepping. He was my PhD in number 11. He also did Ben Tetteson. He did the same job, three years of optimal control. And then there was a range of things. I think uh, I went about this far. And then after this, there were several PhD dissertations. For example, Pontus Isselson, who is not the department, who is doing optimal control. And I think the latest one is probably Hammond. So optimal control has been an important element of the department ever since it was founded. 
So then coming back to calculus of variations. Uh, there's a classic book uh, from 1901. That was before they finished everything off at, uh, uh, in Chicago. And then there's a very good book, Gilbert Blitz. It's called Lectures on the Calculus of Variations, published in 1946. It's a very good summary of the Chicago School. Here's another one published in 1934 called The Calculus of Variations in the Large. Here's another one. And uh, here we have Gelf van Fumi, Calculus of Variations. Then Goldstein is an interesting thing. He was um, a mathematician who was in charge of mathematics at IBM. He, he wrote a very interesting history of calculus of variations. And then L.C. Young is another one. And then here we have Rawlings and Main. They talk about model predictive control. So you can pick. Uh, we have another book that I think maybe on the next slide. Yes. And the last one, Libreson. That's a pretty good theory of calculus of variations. So, and then I wrote a book called Introduction to Stochastic Control Theory. Bryson Hu is a very famous book on optimal control. And they were very active in doing things. Uh, and Athens Fall. Athens was professor at MIT. And Peter Fall was professor at Brown. And, there, and Athens was an engineer. And Fall was a mathematician. So I wrote a good book on optimal control. So there are lots of, lots of stuff to read. I think if you read Lieberson and then you read, for example, Goldstein to get some history, that gives a good perspective. I should mention another person too. Xian was Chinese. Do you know him? <laughs> Have you met him? <laughs> and, uh, he came to MIT and then he was recruited to, uh, to Caltech. And he has written a very interesting book on, called Engineering Cybernetics. And you can see here, transforms input output feedback, non-interaction control, service sampling, etc. And in nonlinear systems, uh, you have control design of perturbation theory, you have op optimization, filtering noise, a very broad book of control. That's still worthwhile scanning through if you're interested in history of control. But uh, he he had opt optimization in his courses. So first we calculate the variations. Uh, oh. Uh, you have a particle that's sliding across a path from A to B, pushed by gravity. And you ask yourself, what should the curve look like to, give, uh, to, to make the particle travel in the shortest time? Uh, well, here's roughly the time. One plus derivative dx, and here is the velocity. So you have to find a path that minimizes this. And that was solved by Bernoulli, Newton, and L'Hopital. But then there were other problems of similar nature. You know, for example, find the you have you have a given curve, and then you try to find uh, the shape of the curve so that you include the largest area. And you all know it's going to be a circuit. Uh, so there were a number of problems like this, and uh, uh, the uh, Chicago they did a lot of work, and, and Bliss wrote a very very good book that essentially summarizes the procedure. And then the field was more or less done by 1950. It was not interesting anymore. Uh, I should see what the problem is. So here is, for example, so you have here a function y of x, and you would like to find a function of the integral of a loss function as minimal as possible. And then if you do the uh, perturbation, and you're, you're, you write down the necessary sufficient condition, you get the Euler-Lagrange equation dl dy minus d, d dx of dl dy prime is equal to zero, and then you have boundary condition. You have boundary condition of zero, and you have boundary condition of one. So you get a differential equation with uh, bo some boundary conditions given at zero, and the other one given at the terminal time. Uh, then there's a fundamental problem. Uh, you know, when you say, assume that something exists. And it, it can be, you know, a solution with smooth curves or derivatives and things like this. But suppose there is no solution at all. And a very simple example is that um, 
assume that the Lord is integer x n. If n is an integer, n squared is also an integer. And n squared, since n, n was the Lord, if n squared is certainly less than or equal to 1, and then you can show that the Lord is integer is than equal to 1. So in other words, if you assume that things exist, and then that don't exist, you get totally ridiculous solutions. And there are plenty of that in uh, calculus of variations, you know. Assume that you have a solution which is smooth, etc. And there may not be a solution that is smooth. So that is one of the fundamental difficulties. Another view of calculus of variation is that you can, <coughs> instead of giving an order differential equation, you can show that this loss function is satisfies a partial differential equation. You form the H, which is L plus P Y prime, and then you minimize this with respect to Y prime, you get H zero. And then you find that the loss function satisfies a partial differential equation with initial conditions. So now you have two ways. Either the Euler-Lagrange equations, where you get uh, the ordinary differential equations, and then you get, you get one boundary at the beginning, one boundary at the end, or else you get a partial differential equation. So that solves the optimization problem. And uh, the very compact notation is that you will take the integrand here and you add py prime, and then you, do, you minimize this with respect to the parameter p. And the euler lagrange case can be written very compactly in forms of h0. And the partial equation can be written similarly in the form of h0. So that's a very nice compact notation of calculus of variations. And then it had a big impact in physics for all natural laws, optics, underwater acoustics. Uh, for example, I did my military service in the Swedish Navy. And uh, we had sonars. And there are temperature gradients in the ocean, which means that under some conditions, you can sit here in Sweden, you can listen all the way across the Baltic under certain conditions. Uh, so uh, uh, it's interesting to look at underwater acoustics. Mechanics can be formulated very nicely in this formulation. Strength of materials, uh, special level relativity. So, uh, optimization has a very strong role in physics. Uh, the same in optics and the same in mechanics where the loss function is typically the uh, sum of, of uh, potential and, uh, 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 and uh, moving energy. It had a strong impact of, of physics. It's a very natural way to formulate the optimal. You're minimizing something. And then, you know, the Euler-Lagrange or the Hamilton-Jacobi gives you the equations you need. So it has a strong impact on physics, and then lately in optimal control. So in optimal control, what's that? Well, typically we have a differential equation. Uh, so we cannot change, uh, and then we have a loss function that depends on x and u, and maybe some final penalty. And in regular calculus of variation, you can change x dot. And here you see you have, a, you have a constraints on x dot, because you can't change x dot directly. You can change u, which is related to that. But it turns out the same formula is applied. So you write down the Hamiltonian, which is the loss function plus p times f, and then you minimize the Hamiltonian, and you write down the Euler-Lagrange equation, or you write down the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So it's very easy. If you, the only difference to calculate the variation is that we don't have x dot as a free variable. We have x dot restricted by this equation. But the formula is looks exactly the same, and we can use the same machinery, which is extremely convenient. And there are two ways to do it, either Euler-Lagrange or Hamilton-Jacobi. So depending on whether you would like to solve a partial differential equation or whether you would like to solve a boundary problem for ordinary differential equation. That's how you pick it. Uh, and here are the three people who moved it forward. So here's the, the Euler-Lagrange view. Euler and Lagrange, and then Pontryagin. And what Pontryagin did, he, he, he introduced limits on the, uh, on the magnitude of the control signal. And I call this the particle view and at least the order of differential equation. Here's another gang, Hamilton, Jacobi, and Delma. So uh, you use the dynamic program and you get the Hamilton, Jacobi equation. And notice in here, these were uh, 1,700 mathematicians, and then 200 years later, Pontryagin came. And here we had 1,800 mathematicians, and then Delma, Delma came a little bit later. So they all tied together. So optimal control and calculus of variation is very similar. In classical, you have free choice of x dot, x prime, 
uh, with optimal control and restricted. But there's really no reason to deal with a special case of uh, classical calculus of variation. So optimal control is a very natural formulation. And of course, to make it useful, we have to learn how to compute it. I'll comment about this later. We talked about computations. So how do you solve the two-point boundary value problem? One way is that you discretize the ordinary differential equations. And then you get a set of constraints. And then you have constraints of the magnitude of u. Uh, so this is something that you can solve by essentially large linear program. Or else you can solve a partial, uh, partial differential equation. You can also have special met methods where you start with one initial condition, you iterate on the other one. So there are lots of methods that have been developed in order to do this. Uh, and here's one example. It is, uh, Bryson was professor at Harvard. And he wanted to demonstrate the power of uh, optimal control. So, so he took an aircraft that had never flown higher than, uh, I think, 18, uh, 15 kilometers something. And then I calculated, how should I guide this aircraft to get as high as possible? And if you're higher than they have ever done, and uh, here's the trajectory. So what you do, you start gradually, and then you go up into a region where the engine is very efficient. And then you just accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. And then it gets a lot of potential of, of energy into the system, and then you just race. So uh, this plane hit them, and then they test flew it. So they had a guy sitting you know, with tables uh, next to the pilot, and they demonstrated <laughs> that uh, this pilot can fly much higher than it ever done before. It was quite a convincing uh, demonstration of optimal control. Uh, so that was you know, right at the, at the right time, you know, right when they were going to shoot up missiles and other things. Uh, so that's an interesting application. Uh, and it's interesting, Pontus at our department, he is, is Pontus here? No. Uh, he is, be, has been working very hard on computation, so he will come in and do guest lecture on computations for you. Then we should talk about stochastic optimal control. There's a mistake, this H should not be in here. Uh, so you have a stochastic differential equation. Uh, you have an order differential equation. What is sigma? It's a stochastic variance of independent arguments. Uh, so you can say that it's a, an ordered differential equation driven by white nodes. And we'd like to find a controller that will not minimize the expected value of this. We made visible controls for such that u of t is a function of current x and past x. Uh, and uh, uh, so question is, what is the optimal control? in this case. So the thing we had, we had essentially added noise to the differential equation. And we do mean values of um, quadratic forms. So if x is a stochastic variable, the expected value of a quadratic form of x is a mean value times s plus mean value plus the trace of s, uh, the, uh, the, of s and then the covariance matrix of all in the equation. So we can calculate the variance of all the uh, and then you can take a system governed by, by a differential equation, and we can use uh, an argument similar to what you do in, in um, uh, calculus of variations. It's much harder to do the ordinary differential equation. Here. But we use Bellman's optimality, and what we do is that we end up with, uh, we do a series expansion. And now when you do a series expansion, you have to take care of terms that are quadratic in DW in the white in the noise because DW has the nine to the square root of T, so DW squared is important. So you get a new term coming into the differential equation, namely this term here. The trace of the second derivative of J and then the sigma plus sigma transpose. So uh, we get uh, we get for the Hamilton Jacobi equations uh, the portion of the relative V with respect to time is the minimum of V with respect to x plus this addition term plus the of the noise. And uh, this is, G is the regular loss function system. And then we have the boundary condition at the final time, this is equal to uh, capital G of x. So it's very similar to the deterministic case. 
Uh, and we can do the same as before. If we, instead of using the Hamiltonian we had before, we are adding the noise term here to the, to the Hamiltonian. So it's not a function of xp and q, the noise variance. And then we minimize this with respect to u, and we have again the hamilton jacob equation. So it's straightforward to introduce a positive differential equation in that case. So if you compare this, the, the difference is that uh, because of the noise, which where the variance is proportionally to t, we get this extra term in the hamilton jacob equation. Otherwise, it looks exactly the same. <coughs> so uh, a couple of things in here. We had, of course, Bryce's record flight, which was very, very influential. And then we had all the launches of missiles and satellites, which was one of the driving force to do this. Uh, then there are some interesting problems. For example, Christian Waterson was looking into moving containers. Do we have the Suppose you have a hanging load, and you're going to move this over to this position in here. The natural way is to move this very quickly halfway, and then it swings over here, and then you move it instantaneously over there. That would be the optimal solution. But then, you know, you can't move infinitely fast, uh, so you have to take into constraints that you have constraints on the thing you move. So Christian Mortensen was looking into that. Um, and his work was then later taken up at Ludio where they were doing it. Then we had another interesting paper that I will talk more about later, and that was Bing Petterson. He was working at Villarreal, and um, uh, you, have a big, you have a big paper mill with uh, lots of processes, and you are going to do changes in thickness of paper, for example. And you have to sch schedule paper operations. You can formulate all this as optimization problems. So he solved uh, um, optimization problems in the pulp and paper index, which I talk in detail a little bit more about later. Then at Tetrapot, we had another problem. You know, at Tetrapot, they made these paper containers for milk. And then you will go and fill them up quickly, you're going to move them. And uh, if you move them quickly, the uh, liquid will slosh, and then it will come up to the border where you have the glue. And then the gluing is not going to become efficient. So we did a project with Tetrapod to figure out how should you move the how should you move the uh, the milk package quickly without getting slushing. So that was another student to Grundelius uh, who did this. So there were several interesting projects we did on this. And I talk about the Grundelius problem. Uh, he made a PhD thesis in 2001, 22 years ago. And uh, the th you can look at the thesis later on. And uh, he was using optimal control to figure out how you should move the container so that the liquid doesn't go up to the case where you have the glue. And uh, uh, he did the analysis, and also he did the implementation of this. Uh, then he quickly flew to the United States and implemented the algorithms in the United States too. So that's a really nice thesis working. Uh, Dave Petterson, he was working at Villarreal, um, and he is his licenciate thesis. And then he developed a mathematical model of the paper mill consisting of 10 states and 9 control variables. And then he uh, derived a solution uh, for the scheduling based on Podgerogi's maximum principle. So you have, uh, and then he, he, you have a boundary value problem, and then he quantized time. And then, you know, you, you get a large linear programming problem. And linear program, they're very efficient algorithms to solve that. So at the mill, they had a computer called the ABM, IBM 1800. Then they had um, 50 rows and 50 columns in the optimization problems. And it took about 20 minutes to do an optimization of them. You know, this was in the, in the, in the, the late 70s, no, late 60s. Uh, and uh, so it took 20 minutes to optimize, and the production control system was implemented in, in a paper mill in November 1969. It's been running continuously since that time, with very good uh, operation. And his, his uh, licenciate thesis describes six months of operation of it. So that's another thesis that might be worthwhile to look at. 
so to summarize all this, I think uh, optimal control is really a nice, elegant subject. You know, it has one foot in the calculus of variations, and then it has developed that was essentially motivated by control, where we had the um, Pontryagin and the maximum principle, which was an extension of the classical ideas, and then we had Delman with dynamic programming. So I think that's a useful piece of information that's certainly worthwhile to incorporate in your knowledge. Uh, and there's nice software available, and many of the problems can actually be solved numerically. And model predictive control is, so to say, a recent addition to this field. So I think you have an interesting time ahead of you in this course. And uh, this introduction is all I wanted to say, unless you have some questions or comments or something like this. I would really encourage you to look at the dissertations by Ben Petrosian, uh, uh, because it's interesting to see how they did it at the time. Okay. Thank you. question yeah. about what the term optimal control refers to, because when I hear about optimality, I either think of optimal versus robust, mm. as in optimal I want to be as quick as possible, I don't care about disturbances, or robust I want to care about disturbances. But this formalism can include disturbances if I want to. So this optimization-based control somehow can also be robust control. Yes. So what do the terms mean? You know, I think it came about where they wanted to shoot up rockets efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the historically came about like this. But this was way before robustness was disguised. And then when robust control was introduced, when LQG, LQG was in Exactly, exactly. Then was that then a contrast to optimal control? Well, you know, sometimes optimal control is, is not robust at all. So, so people discovered then that when they were looking at optimal solution, it had some drawbacks. It was very sensitive to perturbations. And then, you know, robust control came along. So if people had been smart from the beginning, they would like to look, look at robustness at the same time, but they didn't. It took some time to, to do it. But robust control is often also optimization-based. Yeah. So they also have a, an optimization Yeah, they have, they have strong similarities. You can add, you know, robustness as an extra criterion to it, for example. Mm -hmm. So... It could have been incorporated, but it was not in the beginning. It was not incorporated. Okay. They were so happy to find an optimal solution, <laughs> but then they discovered later that robustness is also important. But that took uh, an optimal control came about in the time of war, in the, say 1960. And robustness came into 20 years later. I have another question. Yeah? You talked about some examples, like having a milk package. Yeah? And then I think this is a, a fairly simple problem. I can describe this with a few variables. Yeah. But then you talked about the mill-wide control, I think it was yeah. called. And then there were 10 variables and nine control inputs. Yeah. And then whenever I have talked about uh, finding the optimality as if that would be the solution to everything, then someone with a lot of experience often comes and says, if I take high-order controllers, then I will have robustness issues in practice often. So I should not trust the solution of, for some problems, I think. So I should have some, take these methods with a grain of salt or so and use them in, in simple cases. But if I take a nuclear reactor and I model everything and then I optimize, then it will not work. I think you gave an example where you came to the paper industry and then you wrote down ordinary differential equation for 38 different stages in lots of variables, and then it initially failed, and then you devised simpler models for everything, and then it worked much better. Uh, you know, I think whenever you're doing uh, optimization, you certainly need a model. And uh, you can make many mistakes when you, when you do a model. You can make a model that's too simplistic, that's not capturing the essence. You can also make a model that is overcomplicated at least over endless complications. So I think it takes a lot of judgment to figure out for this particular problem, this issue I'm looking at, what's the right sort of model complexity? So that's certainly an issue that has to be considered. And you're in the middle of that. 
But we can also add, I mean, Matthias Gunnelius thesis is that it was exactly ex evaluating that trade off because he optimized, I mean, we found the minimum time solution. Yeah. But then he realized when applying that on the real machines, it, uh, it was uh, not very good because it's not robust and it led to a lot of, uh, of uh, sourcing. But then what he did was that he instead solved the minimum energy problem, but with a fixed final time that was some one or two percent longer than the actual theoretical minimum time. And then he got much better performance. So, I mean, the minimum time solution could be used as a kind of reference or a kind of benchmark of what can be achieved, but it's typically not the solution that we would apply on a real system in the end. Thank you. Very good. That's another reason why it's worthwhile to look at Grundelius' thesis, you know. They solved the optimization problem, and they also went out to several plants and implemented it, which I think is very 